Good morning. Hi, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm the director of the Energy and National Security Program here uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're very pleased to have all of you here in the room and uh, the folks that are joining us uh, on the web for what is uh, one of our favorite events uh, of the year. Um, we have uh, Fatih Barol here with us today from the International Energy Agency. Uh, Fatih is the chief economist uh, at the IEA and also sort of the lead author on the World Energy Outlook, a publication that we know all of you uh, have come to count on as a source of insights and analysis on some of the key energy trends uh, facing uh, the energy sector and some of the sort of ongoing political and these days geopolitical issues that we're discussing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have Fatih here. Uh, this is, uh, I don't even know how long we've been uh, hosting uh, the WIO, and it is always one of our uh, consistently uh, very, very popular events, so we're very pleased to have all of you here today. It's actually quite shocking to have as many of you here on a Thanksgiving week uh, as this, uh, so that is a real true testament uh, to the work that Fatih and his team uh, put together. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll have uh, Fonte give his presentation of the, this year's World Energy Outlook. Uh, has a focus on uh, nuclear energy and uh, also a special report that you all put out in October, October, uh, on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but then also, you know, just the insights on sort of the policy direction, impacts on climate change, oil markets, uh, and all of the things that we've come to really appreciate about uh, the uh, the work that. Fatih's team uh, puts together in each of these uh, each of these reports. So we'll have a, a, a bit of a presentation, and then uh, we'll have a discussion with all of you. Uh, looking forward to it. So please uh, join me in welcoming Fatih Barul. So. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarah, and uh, a very good morning to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, always a great pleasure to come back to uh, CSIS. Uh, Sarah said it's one of our uh, favorite uh, events, and I can assure you that CSIS is one of our most favorite uh, venues to present uh, our outlook. We are always very happy to have this warm welcome uh, from Sarah, uh, uh, Frank, uh, Mr. Hamner, and uh, others. Now, today, <clears throat> I would like to take you through our uh, last World Energy Outlook 2014 that we published uh, two weeks ago. And uh, I will first uh, try to take you through what is the energy context we are in, uh, we believe, and then try to give a look at the uh, future, and after the pr uh, presentation, as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, we will be very happy to get your uh, uh, questions, comments, uh, suggestions. I should also thank the, there are many colleagues here who gave a hand to uh, our uh, work. Colleagues from DOE, I see here, uh, Matt, and I have my colleagues here, uh, Brent and uh, Ali, uh, helping us. Mr. Hamner, Frank, Sarah gave very good uh, contribution. Thank you very much to uh, all of them. Now, where are we uh, uh, today? First of all, <clears throat> the current calm in the energy markets, we believe, should not mask the challenges we have in front of us. We believe energy security set to move high up in the international policy agenda very soon higher than it is today. We see oil prices coming to uh, $80 in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, brand prices. Lots of oil in the markets. Uh, supply is plenty. Demand is uh, weak. But the, what is happening in Middle East may well have major implications, as I will try to highlight in a minute, for the oil markets sometime soon. In terms of gas markets, uh, we are seeing the same movie third time in Europe especially. We see that the gas security is a permanent and a serious issue. And putting these two things together, looking at the countries where today we see some tensions, such as Iraq, other Middle East countries, Libya, Russia, Ukraine, 
Our first thesis is, despite the slowdown in the prices, prices coming down, despite the less tension uh, visible today, oil and gas security will be crucial for the international policy agenda in the next years to come. The second point, we say stress point in our energy system is about the climate change. We have mixed signals, we are getting mixed signals about uh, uh, climate change. Of course, one very good news, and I will come to it in a meeting, uh, in, in a minute, uh, US-China joint commitment in terms of reducing the CO2 emissions, following the European Union's leaders having a 40% reduction 2030 uh, commitment. This is, of course, a, a good one. But when we look at the numbers, our report shows that last year, CO2 emissions increased again 2.6%, which puts the world perfectly in line with a temperature increase about 3.6 degrees Celsius, which would have devastating implications for all of us. And of this growth, uh, about 60% of that growth came from one country last year, which is uh, China. Second, a rather important issue that we highlight every year and we follow up very closely and providing policy recommendations is the fossil fuel subsidies for the consumers. In many countries, consumers at the pump station, electricity bill, and so on, pay artificially low prices, extremely cheap prices, much, much, much cheaper than their economic value. And this is mainly in Middle East countries, in uh, Russia, Caspian countries, in uh, Asia, China, India, Indonesia. What does this mean to put a subsidy to make the coal, oil, and gas prices much cheaper than what, they are, what the governments are saying, the governments are saying to the, their uh, consumers, to their citizens, please do uh, dirty the world. If you do so, I will pay you money. This is the, more or less the, the translation of it. Or another translation would be giving money to making the things much cheaper than what they are. Please don't worry, use the energy in an inefficient manner. Don't care about the efficiency. You use it as much as you can, waste it as much as you can. This is the messages are given to the, by the governments to their citizens. But in line with our recommendations and the recommendations of others, some countries now are taking the lower oil prices as an opportunity to phase out those subsidies, such as the one in Indonesia now. There is a major reform process in Indonesia and some other countries, but this is a major problem. Third, I think a good news is about an efficiency front. There are colleagues who are much more experienced than me in the, in the work in the governments. They all knew would tell us that efficiency as a concept, as a statement, came out in almost every government's programs, leaders' uh, speeches, uh, the uh, modus presentations like this, and so on, many, many years. But for the first time, we are seeing significant impact of efficiency policies on trends, on numbers, the concrete effect in terms of slowing down the energy demand growth in, in the countries, in the areas where those policies are introduced. This is extremely good, and I will give you some examples on that. But one number that is, I believe, is a very interesting number. Today, in the world, three out of four new cars sold are subject to fuel efficiency standards. And it is new. And it's very good. Efforts have started in Japan, in Europe, followed by the, in the US, especially first Obama administration putting the uh, new standards and uh, then followed uh, uh, by uh, China and now in uh, India. Now, <clears throat> we are going to see, I mean, the, all the, these two stress points on the climate change and on the energy security. They are both very important stress points and complex. Uh, the, the uh, lots of interwoven uh, aspects there. The question is, this change to address them, 
are they going to be changed by the government policies and steer them in the right direction, or the change will be driven by the events themselves? And we do believe the first one may well be uh, better. So, looking at the future. In the future, we see a change about the contribution of different countries in the global energy demand. When you look at the last uh, 10 years, global energy demand increased by 30% in 10 years. It's a big increase. And about half of that growth came from one country, which is China. And in the OECD countries, US, Japan, European countries put together, their energy demand was more or less flat, and we expect this to be flat for the next years to come. There's upward pressure on with the economic growth, but also strong downward pressure on the efficiency gains, so more or less flat. The news is, at least for me, is that we expect China to slow down. And this has, ladies and gentlemen, effect on everything. Oil, coal, investments, CO2, and everything, it will have major effects. And why China is slowing down? There are three reasons. One, I mentioned the efficiency policies. If there is one country I have to pick up and say, this country has very ambitious policies, plus, more importantly, uh, implements them and monitors the results. It is China, by far. Second reason is the Chinese economy is slowing down and changes the nature, moving from a heavy industry-based economy to a slowly but surely a lighter economy. This is the second reason why we see a slowdown in energy demand growth. And third, Chinese population, it is coming to a, a, a peak sometime soon and then will decline, the aging process following the uh, example of uh, Japan. As a result of these three reasons, we expect the dragon will slow down with all its implications on the energy markets and uh, climate change. But there is a new driver now of the global energy demand growth, which is India plus East Asia and the Middle East countries. They are the engine of the global energy demand uh, growth. And we are already seeing in the last uh, two or three years, the numbers are changing while China, when you look at the last two years, China energy demand growth slowed down considerably and the others are growing uh, very uh, strongly. Now, something on the costs, which is a major issue in Europe, in Japan, and in other countries. Are we going to lose our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis United States because of the cost of energy? And our answer is most likely yes with the current policies in place, with the current trends in place, most likely, yes. What we have done, we look at the average cost of energy a consumer pays in different countries, a household, an industry, what they pay for one unit of energy in the past and in the future. How does it change in different countries, the cost of energy to the, to the economy, the, the, the consumers? When we look at the 2008, there was already some difference between Europe, Japan, and the United States in favor of uh, US. And after the shale revolution, while we see, while we see the cost of energy for one unit of uh, energy decline in the United States, it increased almost everywhere else, which puts the United States in a very advantageous position. And the question is, what is in the future? What we expect is it will still, there will be a still significant gap in terms of cost of energy between US versus Japan 
and Europe, but more importantly, perhaps much more importantly, we expect Chinese cost of energy will be higher than even that of the United States. This is mainly as a result of China declining to reducing the share of, uh, the share of dirty but cheap coal and replacing it with other fuels. This is, uh, an, of course, uh, an issue which is a good news for the United States. We uh, hold a strong position vis-a-vis -vis almost all other major players uh, here, and uh, therefore something to take note of. Of course, these trends may well change as a result of efficiency policies. If we use energy more efficiently, we can lower the cost of energy down. Now, an issue about oil markets, something that we feel we need to put the things a bit in a perspective after the shale revolution in the United States. <clears throat> the many colleagues, many commentators, many of us think that the, as a result of the shale oil revolution in the United States now, and the prices are going down, then the situation looks much, much better and more comfortable for the many years to come. A view that we uh, strongly disagree for the following reason. First of all, between now and uh, in the next two, uh, two and a half decades, global oil demand will increase 14 million barrels per day, a modest but a healthy increase, global oil demand. The question is, who is going to meet that demand growth? Which countries? When we look at, when we look at around, there are four strong shoulders, US, Canada, Brazil, and Middle East. All the other countries put together, North Sea, Russia, Mexico, some increase a bit, some decrease a bit, but in total, in sum, they see a bit of a, their total production, a bit of a decline. So how are we going to meet that uh, demand uh, uh, growth? United States, we expect the oil production mainly coming from shale will increase through 2020s, a very good increase, which is a very good news for the global markets. I think today the consumers in the world of United States that the price of oil recently and now are kept in a level which is uh, providing a comfort zone for the consumer. It's a very good news. But when we look at the, 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 the deposits of the uh, shale oil, we expect the, the growth will be significant, but this is far from meeting the entire global oil demand growth, and we expect, as our colleagues from the EIA, sometime soon that uh, growth will come to a, a plateau. From Canada, we also expect strong growth coming from oil sands. Even though there are some challenges, we believe those challenges can be overcome, and we may <coughs> well see a growth coming from uh, Canada, which makes an important contribution. And the third strong shoulder is Brazil. Uh, offshore production, when we look at all these projects, we can see, expect a significant growth coming from Brazil. But there is still a big gap, especially around 2020s, when the production growth from US slows down, where will the oil will come from? And there is only one address, which is the Middle East. If you know anything else, any province that we forgot, please let us know. But this is the, the Middle East. And it is the very reason why we are very worried, among other things, about the current developments in Middle East. Because of this growth in Middle East, half of it needs to come from one country, which is Iraq. When you look at the size of the reserves, when you look at the ongoing uh, plans, when you look at the 
the virginity of the fields. It is Iraq. It's not only our view. It's a view of uh, almost uh, many serious uh, organizations uh, working on that. And in Iraq, of course, very easy geology, cheap to produce the oil, everything is okay. And the only thing is that you have to invest every year $15 billion to make that oil come to the markets. But today, in this security situation, I think the appetite to invest in Iraq and Middle East countries, many Middle East countries, are close to zero. And assuming that the, the issue of uh, uh, the security issue today in Iraq and elsewhere will not be resolved tomorrow, will be with us for some time to come, this is, a, we believe, a major issue. Because if you want to see a production growth in 2020s in the Middle East, we have to invest today. It is not like electricity button, you just push the button and the light comes out. There are many oil colleagues here who, who know it better than me. You need at least five, six years of a, a lead time of a project. And if you aren't able to invest now, how are we going to see the production growth which is badly needed in 2020s unless there is a major economic problem which would uh, push the demand down. So uh, from that point of view, we are very worried. And here, here, the energy security is not only a problem for the IEA countries, our own countries. Because today, a bit more than 50% of the Middle East oil goes to Asia. And tomorrow, it will be more than 90% of the Middle East oil will go to Asia. So therefore, there is a very strong common denominator between the Western countries and the Asian uh, consumers, namely stability and the investment in the Middle East countries to increase the production uh, growth when we need it badly around 2020s. Now, how does the current oil markets fit into this uh, picture. First of all, why do we have the lower price? We think there may be many reasons, but two of them are key. Uh, lots of supply coming from uh, US, very successful uh, 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 growth of US oil production, and at the same time, weak demand. Mainly European economy is weak, China is slowing down. Japan is in a recession. But the question is, will it be down now, prices, for a very, very long time? Our answer is, we don't think that it will be like this for a very, very long time. But there will be a downward pressure on the prices in the next couple of uh, years. And this downward pressure may well mean that many companies may give a second look at their spending plans with the lower price uh, uh, levels. And especially the, the countries or the, uh, the, uh, the deposits fields which require certain level of prices can be more affected than the others. We may well see in North America current price levels, and especially if there is a downward pressure further on, may push the companies to look at their uh, capital expenditures next year. There are already some signs from some uh, major companies to cut the spending plan in 2015, and this may well uh, continue. In uh, Brazil, a big part of the investments are carried out as a result of the, the cash flows coming to the Petrobras. And if they go down as a result of lower prices, this may well put a, uh, have an effect on their investment plans. So the first, the very first effect of the lower prices is putting a downward pressure on the investment plans. And second, 
if the prices stay at these levels, $80 uh, uh, today, while it gives a breathing space for the consumers, a comfort zone, this is very good, but when the prices go down, we may see an upward pressure on the demand growth if the economy is in a normal trajectory. So the going from 110s to 80s may well give an upward pressure on the demand side. So putting these two things together, lower prices, putting a downward pressure on the investments and the production growth, especially in the high cost areas. Second, putting an upward pressure on the demand growth may well mean that we will need, in a lower price environment, perhaps more reliance on the Middle East oil, which once again makes our security uh, concerns even much stronger uh, coupled with the investment challenges we are facing uh, uh, today. Now, a couple of words on natural gas. We see that the natural gas is growing strongly almost everywhere in the world, and sometime soon will overtake oil as the number one fuel in the global energy mix in two decades of time or so. Now, I said everywhere, but there is one exception. It doesn't grow, which is Europe. In Europe, natural gas is in a winter sleep. We think natural gas consumption in Europe will go back to pre-2010 levels only around 2030s. Okay. So therefore, there is a big gap uh, uh, there. So, and for Europe, while the European demand will stay more or less stable, European import needs will increase significantly as a result of the huge declines in the domestic gas production. And the question is, while Europe is now today, is worried that they are getting a big chunk of their gas from one single source with the growing import needs, what to do? And one of the options here in the medium and longer term is LNG. We see that the LNG trade is increasing substantially. Today, 50% of the gas trade is made by pipelines, 50% by LNG, and we think this will grow significantly in favor of uh, LNG, mainly as a result of many LNG projects are uh, coming to a, a completion sometime soon. And not only the amount of LNG is increasing, providing flexibility uh, to, the mark, uh, to the markets from 300 to almost 600 BCM, but the, perhaps more importantly, the countries which produce LNG are increasing. So double flexibility. Lots of LNG providing flexibility, plus the, the number of countries are growing. To the current ones, we expect the US, Canada, African countries, Mozambique, Tanzania, and big projects from Australia, lots of LNG coming to the markets. This will make the hands of the consumers stronger in terms of the options they have in front of them if they use their cards uh, cleverly. However, we do not believe that so much LNG coming to the markets will bring the gas prices down to the, as many people hope, to the US gas price levels. There will be still a major price gap between US and the uh, rest of the uh, for, for Europe or uh, Japan for two reasons. One, the co capital cost of LNG, we have colleagues from uh, LNG companies here, are going up. And second, 
shipping gas from point A to point B is a costly business. So to bring the uh, U.S. gas to Europe costs about six, six fifty seven uh, dollars just to bring it uh, here, plus the uh, price about four dollars is already eleven eleven dollars. So this is growing LNG is a very important trend, a good news for the consumers from a flexibility point of view, but the hope that the gas prices will go down uh, is not a view that we subscribe. Now, a few things on coal markets. We see that the coal demand is slowing down with all its implications. Now, we have seen the coal demand peaking in the Europe in mid 90s, 80s, then the US uh, uh, mid uh, uh, 2005, and now the most important thing is we see a Chinese coal demand plateauing. This is extremely important. Even if you don't have anything to do with coal in your life, it is important for you because you have to do something with gas. And this will affect coal gas price competition worldwide. This will affect the CO2 emission trends. This will affect the investment in renewable trends. And this is what we are uh, 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 projecting. And I can tell you, leave aside our projections. Until last two years, Chinese coal demand increased 10% per year on average, like an automatic uh, pilot. In the last two years, the growth rate in 12 and 13 was about 5% per year. So you may say 10%, 5%, what is the difference? The difference is, giving the size of China, 10% uh, versus 5% in one year is equal to uh, all the, the ASEAN Asian countries uh, coal consumption put together. So all put the ASEAN countries there, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, all of them is equal to that 5%. So this is very, very important trend. And this is mainly driven by local pollution concerns. But we expect a India to move up in terms of coal consumption very strongly. And uh, soon, overtake U.S. as the second largest coal consumer, uh, second after China. And as I said, we see a coal uh, slowing down, and we have already the first signals of that. If the coal industry would like to see the trend going up, still, the buttons to be pushed are on the technology front. How to use coal uh, through CCS, through other technologies in an environmentally friendly uh, way. But this will have implications for the uh, market uh, equilibrium in many aspects. Now, coming back to power sector, we again wanted to challenge one issue. Many colleagues uh, think, many governments uh, think that we, the demand growth in the OECD countries are more or less flat, electricity demand growth. So electricity sector is not a, such an important sector anymore because our demand slowed down. This is again an idea we don't agree with because in the OECD countries today, the need for building new power plants are not coming from the fact that the demand is growing but mainly the existing capacity is retiring and we have to replace them. Today, worldwide, we have about 6,000 gigawatts of power plants, the entire world, and within the next two decades, we see 40% of the existing capacity will leave us, they will retire. Power plants are like the human beings, they produce power, come to a certain age, and then, then retire. This is, this, is the, this is the unfortunate destiny. So this is, this, is, this is what happens. And then they are thrown out, the power plants. So <laughs> here, what happens is that 
in the OECD countries, even though the demand growth is electricity demand growth is almost zero, we have to build a lot of power plants to replace the, especially the thermal capacity. And what is the thermal capacity, uh, what is the new capacity coming from in the future? This will be mainly renewable energies as a result of government support. And this is subsidies. About half of the growth of the new capacity worldwide will be renewables. But when I say renewables, mainly hydropower, followed by wind and solar. And we see also significant amount of natural gas. So we see more and more an approach in many countries between renewables and natural gas. So the, the, the point is, this retirement issue, especially in the OECD countries, while it poses an important challenge in terms of finding the money, etc., it at the same time gives you an opportunity if you want to give a new shape to your power system, going from coal to gas, or from coal to gas to renewables, from centralized to decentralized, whatever you want, you have now a chance to mix the cards uh, again in the OECD countries. And another challenge, especially for Europe, this is a major problem, and perhaps in the US as well, the penetration of renewables are so strong that you do not have enough reliable power to support the renewable energies. In Europe, in the next 10 years, we need to, we need to build 100 gigawatts of uninterruptible power. It can be large hydro, gas, or, or whatever. And the appetite for investment is close to zero now. And this is a major issue from a security of supply uh, point of uh, uh, view. So, uh, therefore, to find the balance between the renewable policies and the system reliability remains a challenge for Europe and perhaps in other countries as well. Now, renewables, as I said, they are growing very strongly. And the good news is a big chunk of the renewables are coming from wind and solar in addition to hydropower. And the amount of subsidies we are paying them will soon come down as a result of cost reductions. So this is definitely a very, very good development that the cost of renewables in some cases are coming down, onshore wind and some solar uh, technologies, which is uh, uh, good from the economics uh, point of view. But from a system reliability point of view, we still need have reliable supply there. As Sarah mentioned, every year we look at all the fuels in general, but one fuel in particular, in depth. It can be one year oil, one year efficiency, one year coal, and this year we look at the uh, nuclear power. We see that many countries in the world are still interested in building nuclear power plants after Fukushima. We expect that there will be a strong growth, and this growth uh, will come mainly from non-OECD countries, mainly, but not exclusively. And they are driven by three factors. Renewables, many countries believe it is good for energy security. Second, it is a reliable base load uh, generation of electricity. And third, a very important tool to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So as a result of these drivers, energy security, economics, and the climate change, we expect the renewables will grow, but with the current policies, we do not see a nuclear renaissance in sight. In Europe, we are seeing a 
big decline of nuclear capacity, mainly as a result of retirements, as there is, uh, because of their age come to a certain level, because we built most of the nuclear power plants in Europe 60, 50, 60 years ago. And as a result of some governments, such as Germany, Belgium, and others, want to phase out their nuclear plants in a, a premature way. And of course, with all respect to all the governments to choose this way or that way, I personally believe it is the government's responsibility if they phase out one technology, they have to make sure that how this gap with which technology it is going to be compensated, filled, and what are the economic, energy security, and climate change implications of this new uh, plan. I think this is very uh, important. In Japan, we expect uh, slowly but surely we will see nuclear plants come in the uh, command stream after uh, the uh, Fukushima uh, incident. And there, there will be some new, a few new uh, additions, but we, all, we will also see some retirements in Japan as well. But in some, we expect the Japanese nuclear uh, power plants will still play an important role in the Japanese nuclear Japanese energy future, but will be less pronounced than before uh, Fukushima. Yes, we expect some uh, net increase. There is six gigawatt of plants under construction, especially those areas where prices uh, have a more regulated uh, nature. India and Russia, they are making a, a significant amount of efforts to build nuclear power plants. Both of them are building today, especially India. Russia has huge plants. We are uh, discounting their plants, being, uh, taking it through a feasibility fil uh, filter. But, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest growth in terms of nuclear comes from one country only, which is China. About 50% of the new nuclear capacity in the world will come from China. And when you look at, in fact, today, today we have 80 gigawatts of plants under construction, 80 gigawatts. Half of it is being constructed in China. So what are the implications of that? First one, there are many, but I want to say two of them. The first one is, China is today developing it is new, it is own nuclear technology. And by building, constructing a lot of nuclear power plants, bringing the cost down, and we may well see China soon to be a serious competitor to Western countries in terms of exporting the nuclear technology. Today, the main nuclear technology countries in North America, in Europe, in Japan, uh, Korea, we may well see China with the a new generation and lower cost may well be a, a serious competitor there with all its implications. Second, today in the world, 80% of the nuclear plants are in OECD countries, 20% in non-OECD countries. As a result of this picture, in two decades of time, it will be 50% OECD, 50% non-OECD countries of the nuclear power plants uh, worldwide. And of course, this will have uh, lots of implications in terms of climate change, in terms of energy security, and all other uh, issues. <clears throat> For nuclear today, we see two major challenges. One is the finance, the prices. The other one is the public concerns. And in terms of public concerns, we think 
governments who really seriously want to address the, uh, the have a nuclear plan must listen the concerns of the uh, people and try to address them. There are two of them we want to uh, highlight. The first one is that we expect in the next two decades or so, we will see as a result of natural and policy-related retirements, we will see 200 nuclear power plants are going to retire. And up to now, we have about the experience worldwide with the retirements about 10 nuclear power plants, more or less, the commissioning. So how are we going to deal with these 200 nuclear power plants retiring? How are we going to decommission them? What to do with them? We don't have experience. And in most of the countries, we are not well prepared how to deal with them. And this is not only for the countries who want to pursue nuclear policy, but also the ones who want to say goodbye to the, their nuclear policy. What are, what are we going to do with these 200 nuclear power plants? A serious uh, challenge in front of us. The second one is about the waste. Today, as a result of generation of uh, nuclear power in the last few decades, we have about 350,000 tons of nuclear waste, and this will be doubled based on the projections I show to you coming from different countries. And today, when we look at the world, the attempts to store dispose the nuclear waste is very, very limited. There are many temporary solutions, but to have a permanent solution, the international efforts are not at their maximum what they have to be, and therefore uh, our call is to, uh, that there's a need for concerted international efforts to uh, find a solution to the high-level uh, waste, uh, once again, in, in, within the international collaboration uh, framework. And we have enjoyed very much the, the proposal, the suggestions we got from uh, Mr. Hamre in that context. So before finishing an important issue, a critical issue, which is the uh, climate change. Now, energy sector, as we all know, is the main responsible sector when it comes to climate change. Why? More than two-thirds of the emissions causing climate change come from the energy sector. So we wanted to look where we are today in terms of climate change, because the scientists told us that in order to keep the world more or less like today, temperature increase should be maximum two degrees Celsius, which is, I think, if I'm not wrong, nine degrees Fahrenheit, if, if, if uh, I'm not wrong. So, how we want to see where are we today with that uh, uh, perspective. The Mother Nature told us that you human beings, I give you a budget an allocation of dirtying the world, putting a CO2 in the atmosphere, which is 2,300 gigatons. If you emit more than this, you jump on the threshold and just get ready to be in a different world. This is our threshold, and this agreed, this two degrees target by the world leaders a few years ago. And when we look at the where we are, as of today, we, human beings, already consumed half of the budget given to us. So the, the, the allowance of dirtying the world, half of it uh, is already used through the Industrial Revolution, most of it, by using a lot of coal, oil, and gas, putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And if we continue with our current policies, with the projections I show to you, which takes into account the new policies put in place, we see 
that around 2040, we are completely exhausting the budget given to us. So then, because the emissions in 2040, about 80% of the emissions in 2030, 40 is already determined today, with the investment we are making today. So we are looking in at that future. So it means if we don't have a major change in the energy investment trends, we may well say goodbye to the world we used to have since uh, several uh, centuries. And in that context, to give a signal to the energy investments, clean energy investments and efficiency, I believe we have a historical chance, which is the chance in Paris next year, 2015 Paris uh, meeting. And before that meeting, we have heard very encouraging news. First of all, European Union made a statement, has a now a, a package reducing the emissions by 40% in 2030. Second, President Obama and President Xi jointly announced a commitment for both countries. And this is extremely important for three reasons. One, numbers. US plus China responsible for 45% of the emissions, plus Europe 15%, altogether 60% of the emissions, there is a political commitment at the highest level. The countries which show the, the a responsible leadership at the international level, 28 European countries plus United States plus uh, China. This is the, in terms of numbers. Second, this I believe, especially China and US being a part of the game, this will inject a very strong political momentum to the Paris process. It will be more and more difficult for the countries who are other significant emitters who will not who will not be a part of the coalition of finding a solution. It will be very difficult for them to afford not to be part of the countries who want to find a solution. And these countries are is that the 28 European countries, US and China, the political momentum, number two, all these countries. Number three, I believe the key issue here is China. In Europe, and I believe in North America, in Asia, many people who direct their feet to find a solution to climate change said, say, and will say that we can do a lot of things to reduce the CO2 emissions, but if, if China doesn't move, we cannot find a solution. So why should we punish our economy if China, the largest emitter, doesn't move? And now, China moving, making such a commitment for the first time putting a target, if you wish we can discuss this target, what it means, is for me taking that argument from the hands of the people who drag their feet. To sum up, I am optimistic, cautiously optimistic about this Paris event, and it may be well our last chance to give the right signal to the clean energy investment so that we can be in line with the, our uh, two degrees target, or at least we don't throw the two degrees target in the trash. Currently, the clean energy investments for efficiency, for renewables, for uh, uh, nuclear and so on, are about $400 billion. 
In our central scenario, which finishes everything around 2040, the budget is closed, they are already increasing twice. But to be able to see, to save the world, if I may say so, to save the planet, we need to increase the clean, clean energy investment four times compared to today. And this will not happen if there is not a serious signal coming to investors that they, may, they will be punished or they will be rewarded with their investments uh, coming depending on the technology they choose. And Paris may well be the kickoff of that uh, very uh, new uh, wave or accelerating the clean energy investment trends. So, ladies and gentlemen, if I can finish up our uh, words, I believe in terms of energy security, there is a growing risk at present in a number of parts of the world that are very important strategically for the energy sector. Iraq, Libya, other Middle East countries, Russia, North Africa, these are very uh, crucial uh, countries, provinces, and as such, the current lower oil prices should not disguise the challenges we have in front of us, and I believe energy security will be a crucial issue in the next uh, years to come. The, what is happening in the Middle East today raises concerns about the investment flow in the uh, region as a result of lack of security, lack of predictability, and if the invest, investments do not come in a timely manner, we may well see the future production work is very, very weak, and this may, have, uh, this may bring challenges for the oil markets. Many countries believe nuclear energy can play an uh, important role in terms of the energy security, improving energy security, addressing climate change, but the public concerns remain a major issue together with financing, and this needs to be addressed if the governments take the uh, nuclear expansion plans uh, seriously. We are in the opinion that the a, a success story in Paris may well change the flow of investment for clean energy technologies, renewables, efficiency, nuclear power, switch from coal to gas. But to do that, we have to see a, an, an agreement, a major political will coming uh, from uh, uh, Paris, and as such, the recent China-US deal following the European uh, targets is a very welcome uh, step. And finally, we at the IEA, we believe that the market instruments are the best to address the energy sector challenges, for sure. But looking at the, the complexity of these two major problems we are facing, energy security, oil, gas, economics, foreign policy, defense, all of these things, plus the, uh, the climate change. So many things are involved. Uh, there is a need that these market policies are put in a framework by far-sighted government policies to steer us in a right direction. Thank you, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Fadi, thank you very much for that wonderful and comprehensive look at, uh, well, actually, it's probably not comprehensive. There's probably a lot more in the WIO uh, the, than, uh, than what you highlighted there, but um, certainly a lot of issues to talk about. I, we have about 20 minutes for conversation. I'm going to open up to the audience in just a moment, but I thought maybe I'd start with a couple questions uh, that I had. Um, one is uh, you were 
you were pretty pessimistic about sort of the prospect for increased investment uh, in the Middle East, given sort of what you term as turmoil, right? But you were also pretty positive about uh, investment in Brazil, which uh, to some outside perspective could look kind of tumultuous as well. Um, how much of your view on both of those countries is predicated on a security environment versus the sort of investment commercial framework governance architecture that both put on the table? Because I could argue that, that, that for both of those regions, those are really the crux of the issues that dissuade investment. I, I thank you. For Middle East, the main reason why we are uh, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but we are questioning the growth from Middle East around 2020 is lack of investment, not because of the economics, but because of the security issue here. The, uh, the current uh, lack of security and the unpredictability of the Middle East may well mean that uh, some key investments are not carried out especially in Iraq, where we expect half of the growth uh, come from. And when we talk with the Iraqi colleagues uh, uh, today, we see that the, the, the appetite for investment is almost uh, close to zero. This is the reason why we are uh, concerned. For Brazil, this is a different story. This is a story of the ability of Petrobras to be able to uh, raise the uh, 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 necessary funds. And as we highlighted in our report, and also uh, try to do it now, if the prices go to uh, uh, $80 and uh, below, we may see that the uh, Brazil may be one of the uh, regions which will have the toughest challenges because the investments are basically financed through uh, cash flows. And if they go down, they need to go and increase their debts, which will be a major issue for Petrobras. Of course, there is an important question mark about the uh, production growth coming from uh, Brazil as well. Maybe turning the page a little bit on sort of the issue of subsidies, an issue that I would give you know uh, you all and, and the IEA in general tremendous credit for actually framing a lot of the debate and, and actually quantifying a lot of how we talk about energy subsidies on both the fossil-based and renewable energy side of the equation. You mentioned that there was progress being made on, on sort of the subsidies issue. It, how can you can you characterize a little bit the, the sort of nature of that progress? Because I think one of the ways you sort of talked about it was sending a signal about sort of using energy inefficiently or using sort of one kind of energy versus another. For a lot of the countries where these subsidies exist, one of the real political challenges of getting them removed is they see them as sort of a, a sort of um, an access issue or an equitability issue. Are we becoming smarter about how we implement sanctions? Uh, and are you guys seeing evidence of that in your research? I think these, the subsidies, exactly, subsidies are, uh, uh, being questioned by many governments, mainly because of uh, the pressure on the budget, because governments are feeling this uh, big pressure on their budget, and it is becoming, even for the oil producing countries, becoming a major, major problem. Uh, in Indonesia, the main reason that they move ahead is because of the, um, because of the government budget cannot afford any more, and there was a new government, a freshly elected government, has the uh, strong uh, uh, confidence of the, its voters, and they took a very good step in the right direction, very much in line with our uh, suggestions. Uh, in Middle East, many governments are taking steps, especially in power generation. Today, in Middle East, we use two million barrels per day of oil to generate electricity. From economic point of view, this is not economic, I should say. I didn't want to say something. Uh, it is uh, something like that. You, to run your car, you use Chanel Saint Parfum. So this is to, to, to run your car. This is, it has no economic uh, value at all. So, uh, but the, the governments are uh, seeing it and they are they are moving to gas, especially, and uh, others. Again, in Middle East, because I say Middle East because half of those subsidies are in Middle East countries. It is, for me, it is unbelievable that on one hand, 
governments want to improve the renewable energies to have a market share. On the other hand, they are putting substantial subsidies for fossil fuels. This, this is, I mean, this is unbelievable because you push the renewables in order to have a better chance to compete in terms of prices to give you subsidies, but you give more subsidies to fossil fuels and you have no chance. This is definitely not a uh, 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 right way. And as you said, we work on Africa this year. And one of the reasons why people say we have uh, subsidies for uh, energy is to protect the poor. And our numbers show that out of this money, 550 billion, only 8% of the subsidies go to 20% lowest income groups, and more than 90% of the subsidies go to medium and higher income groups. So it doesn't, at the end, help the uh, poor, it helps more the medium and higher income levels. So therefore, we have some uh, suggestions uh, with the, uh, in the context with the G20, how to, uh, how to uh, realize these um, uh, subsidy reforms. And we'll be working also this year with the Turkish G20 uh, president, uh, presidency to move the subsidy program uh, further. Okay, one final question for me, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, and I, you know, you know, I can't get away with not asking sort of a climate change question. And one of the interesting things, you know, for those of us who've read your your report for the you know years upon years, uh, and look at sort of the climate messages that you've brought, I think one year it was sort of the door is almost closed, and then sort of the next year it was well, just to avoid the lock-in. And and you basically said, you know, uh, last chance for two degrees. Yeah. Is that how you're really characterizing Paris and, and uh, putting your long-term forecasting hat on? What happens if, uh, what needs to happen in Paris to, to feel confident that we're on that path? And if we're not, what comes next? I mean, the thing is, if we have to understand uh, one thing in the energy sector, it is very different than the others. Uh, tomorrow's, uh, in 20, 30 years of oil, gas, coal, CO2 trends, are determined by today's investments. So it doesn't in the, there's a long lead time. You, the decision and the impact, there's a big time lag here. So the 2040 trends, 2040 CO2 emissions are determined today's investments. So if we are not able to get the, our acts together and give a new impetus to clean energy investments, unless, as I said, unless there is a major economic downturn, we will, uh, we have to say goodbye to the uh, two degrees world. This is uh, what we are seeing. And uh, to be, uh, to be very uh, frank, uh, we then, if we are able to get the Paris Agreement, which is the one which could give a signal to all the countries, investors and others that a climate change is a major issue when you make your business plans. If it doesn't go through, it can be through international agreement, through a ceiling, through uh, some uh, type of uh, 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 allocation of uh, responsibilities, then uh, we better uh, try to find out what are the ways to get used to in a different planet. Okay, we're going to take some questions now. We've only got about 10, 15 minutes left, so I'm going to group them in threes. Please wait for the mic, identify yourself, and put your question in the form of a question, please. We'll start right here. I'll take three. Yeah. Three, four, uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. Just a Europe question about um, the price differential you mentioned and the competitiveness issue. Is there a possibility that if Europe increased its own shale gas production, that uh, some of that uh, competitiveness issue would, would be addressed. And then we'll go right here. Yeah, right here. Hi, uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. I have a, do you have any China-specific recommendation or comments on its uh, sort of a nuclear energy plan? Actually, specifically, I mean, the government announced last week to triple the power, nuclear power generation capacity by 2020, and more will be under construction. Thank you. Oh, Jamie, did you have one? Yeah, 
Oh, Jamie, go ahead and then we'll, we'll take Thank you. Uh, Fata, thanks so much for your uh, comments. Uh, in the short term, this week is the uh, OPEC meeting, and you are unique in that uh, you have worked for both OPEC and now at the IEA. How, how much do you think that the U.S. shale boom is going to end up complicating, if at all, that OPEC decision, both, both just this meeting, but also over the next year to two years? Okay, and then one final one from the court. I will call Johns Hopkins. Question uh, on nuclear power. Uh, some industry people would contend that uh, the prospect of SMRs, small modular reactors, could give a very positive stimulus to the industry uh, because they would be cheaper, shorter construction times, safety, et cetera. Uh, yet none of these have been uh, licensed so far. I'm just curious, how did you treat that issue in your analysis of going forward? In Europe, uh, we have today a, a significant amount of shale gas uh, deposits in Poland, Germany, France, uh, UK, if you consider Ukraine. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, expect that uh, in the next 10 years it will be uh, bring a major contribution to European gas supply. Having said that, if we start to work very hard, and if we get rid of the dogmatic barriers we have in front of us, uh, not to make use of uh, shale gas, it may well help us at least to compensate the decline in the European conventional gas production, and as such could be an important factor in improving the uh, competitiveness of uh, Europe. This will not be enough to close the gap between Europe and the United States, but it can definitely be helpful in terms of narrowing that gap and also good for the uh, gas security of uh, uh, Europe. Now, nuclear energy in China, this is definitely uh, one of the most important push that uh, China has in its energy history. When I look at our numbers, uh, China is making a lot of efforts on efficiency and renewables, but when I look at the nuclear numbers, they are very, very impressive, which means half of the growth in the global nuclear capacity will come only from uh, uh, China. This reminds me that uh, at that scale, China, uh, between uh, mid-1980s and mid-1980s and mid-1990s, in 10 years of time, brought electricity to half a billion people. There was uh, the five, half, 500 million people didn't have access to electricity, but there was a big collective action, and China brought electricity to those people as a result of government decision. This at the same level, it will be very important for the, uh, reducing the share of uh, coal in the Chinese uh, power gen mix. It will be very good uh, for uh, reducing the uh, CO2 emissions, and it will bring, uh, it will, uh, bring uh, China as an important nuclear power and in terms of nuclear capacity, China will overtake the United States as the number one nuclear power in, in the world. So as such, uh, uh, I think uh, the Chinese emergence as a major nuclear power producer will uh, redefine the uh, nuclear landscape uh, if the other countries do not change their uh, uh, policies. The third question, uh, uh, yes, uh, what do we expect from the next OPEC uh, meeting? It, a question that I will not be able to comment, but I can tell you the following. Shale oil from the United States, oil sands from uh, Canada, these are extremely important uh, uh, developments in the hydrocarbon sector in revolutionary nature, and this provides a lot of comfort uh, this provides the energy security zone for uh, many people. As such, they are very, very important. However, I would highlight that we will, we shouldn't forget that even these two success stories, we will still need Middle East oil in the future. I think we should therefore view the current investment issues, current security issues in Middle East from uh, that angle. We shouldn't be blind with the big numbers we are seeing today. There is also a tomorrow, 
and uh, this is very important to put things, therefore I believe in a, a perspective. SMRs are uh, important, especially given the growing appetite of many emerging countries who cannot finance uh, standard uh, uh, big uh, nuclear uh, uh, power plants, but we need to see their feasibility and transferability from one country uh, to another. But as we have highlighted in our report, they may well uh, play an important role in the emerging countries where the finance is limited, but uh, the electricity demand is growing and they have uh, limited uh, natural resources. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. We've got what time for one more quick round. So uh, we've got one back there. We'll do one over here. Yeah, Nina Gardner, Strategy International. Hi, Fatih. Um, just re reacting to what something you just said, um, how do you square the whole tar sands uh, issue with the two degree centigrade um, target? I don't see how you can square that whole. Just because I think your mic wasn't on, it was a question about gas price decline in Asia. Uh, okay. Uh, and then one more right here. Back to the department. Jeff Bowie, private investor. Um, how certain are you or confident are you that CO2 is the um, most important? It's the most important, but how, how confident are you the other? Uh, gaseous pollutants are contributing to global warming. Thank you. Okay. So, <clears throat> oil sands, or as you describe, uh, uh, tar, tar sands, they do emit more emissions than um, uh, conventional oil. This is uh, true, but if you put them, if you put it in a context, how much additional CO2 comes from oil sands vis-a-vis -vis conventional oil, the difference is really, really very limited. I will tell you uh, the, the, the numbers. In our report, we expect that the, uh, the oil sands will increase about 3 million barrels per day. If we assume this 3 million barrels per day wouldn't come from oil sands, but would come from average conversion oil somewhere else, this 3 million barrels per day, in oil sands, it stays as it is. The difference of additional CO2, oil sands versus conventional, is equal to the not even one day of emissions of China in an entire year, 23 hours very small additional CO2 emissions growth. Yes, there is, a, there is an increase there, but it is very, very small if you put in the context. And if we want to see oil sands to play a role for energy security or for something else, then we have to find a way to compensate these 23 hours of China's daily uh, CO2 emissions uh, growth. It can be carbon capture and storage, it can be efficiency, it can be renewables through other uh, technologies. Gas price in Asia, I didn't say that uh, it will not there will be a downward pressure on the prices, but what I said is that we shouldn't expect that it will be that the U.S. prices everywhere. There will be at least a downward pressure if it comes there, but we shouldn't also forget that the cost of capital of uh, building uh, LNG facilities are going up. And uh, therefore, perhaps we will not see the today's uh, 16, 17 dollars, but we will see a downward pressure, but it will be very much far from what we have in the United States today. But the US, uh, US gas will definitely help to uh, provide some flexibility in the markets in Asia. And it would also uh, uh, bring uh, uh, downward pressure on the uh, prices. There are other gases than CO2. Methane is another uh, uh, gas, and there are many other uh, gases. But the CO2, when we talk about the energy sector, 
CO2 uh, is uh, one of the most potent gas together with uh, uh, methane and the other side. It is the reason since the uh, about uh, more than two thirds of the emissions of CO2 comes from the energy sector. It is the very reason we look at CO2. But other gases are important, methane. And for methane, there are many initiatives, one of them belongs to uh, us, how to uh, reduce them. And it is uh, rather, compared to CO2, easier to fix, uh, to be honest with you, through some uh, technical and regulatory uh, measures. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end of our time. I just wanted to thank uh, Fatih for being here. I know you've got to go to New York and continue the, the WIO tour. Um, but, you know, given your, your description of uh, retirement in the power generation sector, we know there's no, uh, there's no uh, risk of you retiring anytime <laughs> soon. So uh, we'll hope to see you again here sometime in the very near future. I want to thank you and, and your team for just the excellent work that you bring to the, the broader energy discussion. On our side, I want to thank Annie Hudson on our team for putting together today's event. And, Please join me in thanking Fatih.